He is one of the most sought after and successful artists today. His works have sold for tens of millions of dollars and his fans include the likes of Hollywood mogul Jeffrey Katzenberg and Lady Gaga. Jeff Koons is a former Wall Street commodities trader who left the financial world to pursue his dream of becoming an artist. His work is unique, often involving pictures of dogs, tulips, lobsters, even a large pile of Play-Doh and cracked eggs. Some have called his work lively and playful, while others refer to it as childish and banal. But for millions of his fans, his work stands out. This stainless steel sculpture, the Balloon Dog Orange, was sold at auction for $58.4 million, turning him into the most expensive living artist of all time. Throughout his career, his art has gone through several phases, from industrial production to ceramic statuettes, even dabbling in a bit of sexuality. But whether you're a fan of his work or just discovering him for the first time, Jeff Koons is at the top of his game, perfectly comfortable habiting the worlds of art and pop culture. In Doha, a city he frequently visits, he discusses what his work is all about, what he aims to express through his pieces and the controversies surrounding his creations and his career as Jeff Koons talks to Al Jazeera. Jeff Koons, welcome to Talk to Al Jazeera. I mean, you are certainly at the moment the undisputed king of contemporary art. How do you think you got into that position? What is it that your art, do you think, gives people? Uh, it's very kind to say that. But, uh, you know, from the time that I was a child, I just wanted to participate. And I wanted to be involved in a dialogue uh, about art. I wanted to be part of the avant-garde, you know, with uh, uh, Duchamp and Dali, uh, Picabia, Picasso. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm not special, you know. I know that uh, people of my own generation uh, growing up, and we would sit and we'd have a dialogue about art. There were people that were brighter. There were people that had uh, other uh, talents that uh, were maybe sharper. But I, I wanted to participate. And I really think that it comes down to that in life, that uh, people end up kind of assuming kind of responsibilities in certain areas because, uh, you know, they want to more than others. Uh, I'm trying to be as generous as I can be uh, with my understanding of art. You say you wanted to participate, but you've certainly been very successful in that participation. I mean, you've just had 58 million, a record for a living artist spent on your orange uh, dog. Five, How did that make you feel? You know, that's really very abstract because, uh, you know, people look at numbers like that and they think of the value of art. But uh, the reason I'm involved with art is its true value and that it's life changing. It's transformative. I mean, it's been able to give me the intellectual, uh, emotional life that I've wanted. And, uh, you know, it can make you a better person. And that's really its value and how it connects you with, you know, what it means to be human, connects you with your community. That's the value of art. So are you saying that these prices are, are, are totally out of whack or are, are just too much? Because, I mean, your art sells for millions as it, as it yeah. exchanges. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a form of abstraction. I mean, it's a, a form of value and maybe society saying that, uh, you know, they believe that these objects uh, are relevant to, uh, you know, our culture and can help us survive. Or, but it's, a, it's another form of abstraction from the reason that I'm involved with art. Uh, I'm involved with art for the feelings, for the sensations of what it's like to be alive, and how it's able to uh, let me become vaster and uh, vaster uh, not in an economic sense, vaster in an in, in emotional and in, in intellectual sense. Uh, how to be uh, more generous, how to uh, communicate and to become what I can be. Talk me through what you should feel when you look at your art. I mean, it, it, much of it is very simple. Uh, it's all beautifully finished, uh, perfection, but often very childish 
items that, uh, you know, it's been described as banal, banal to the iconic, iconic to the banal. Tell us what we're supposed to be thinking. Um, well, I hope that you look at uh, a work and you're curious, uh, that you feel a sense of familiarity, that you don't feel distanced by art, that you feel that uh, it's a dialogue that's about yourself. Because uh, an, a really great artwork is a transponder. And uh, there is no art in it. It just is able to set up the viewer to have an interaction with themselves. And when you experience art, you're feeling your own possibilities of what you can become. That's art. That's, that's where you find art. It's in the viewer where inside themselves they're feeling more possibility. And they may not feel it right at that moment. They may. They may feel really excited by something. Or it may just hit them, you know, uh, 10 minutes later. Uh, but it's that ability to be able to give people insight into their own possibilities and that they can get a sense of their own expansion. There's a lot of conversation about your art, obviously. You're possibly one of the most written about artists in the world and about you. I mean, people are saying, look at him. He's fine, you know, always well turned out. Is he laughing at us? Is he making us laugh at him? What is it? Uh, I'm sincere. <laughs> and uh, one of my dealers, Antonio Homan, uh, really thinks that I'm one of the kind of last romantics in a way. But uh, I think it's really important that an artist is just as sincere and as honest and as generous as possible. And, uh, you know, th that's the only thing that you can do. And as an artist, to be able to come in contact with uh, something that can kind of take you to a metaphysical place, uh, kind of a universal language, uh, the only thing you can do is trust in yourself and follow your interests. And if you do that, trust in yourself, follow your interests, and then focus on those interests, it'll always take you to that place where you connect to a universal vocabulary, a, a vocabulary that really connects uh, uh, all human beings. Uh, well, I think that art is uh, very inclusive and that it's a, a vocabulary about what really what people share, what the interests are, what it means to be human, and what our possibilities are. But uh, there is something very uh, inner engaging, interacting. Uh, the art is really so much about the art world, this inclusiveness, this kind of sense of family. And uh, artists are inclined, you know, they want to interact, they want to exchange information. Uh, Art's a form of communication. Uh, it takes two to communicate, you know. So it's really about interaction, of sharing. And I wonder, as an artist, being a provocateur, how you felt when you heard about the fact that you've got ISIL destroying artworks. How did that make you feel, and what do you think the art community can do, if anything at all? Well, I think every human being, you know, uh, makes these decisions every day of their life as far as how you respect yourself, how you respect each other, and the way you go about your life showing that respect to uh, people, that the type of um, uh, freedom you want in your own life and uh, the way you exercise your own life, that you uh, treat others in the same way. Uh, but it's always uh, horrifying. It's horrifying to see history uh, destroyed, to be uh, wiped out uh, because uh, you know this is what we have that informs us about our past and uh, who we are and uh, you know art uh, does connect us to that but to be able to find those places you have to have reference points you have to have something to reflect back to of uh, to kind of weave your vocabulary do you court controversy uh, no and uh, you know I think that if if artists do, or individuals in whatever area, it's short-lived. And uh, but I think that uh, honesty uh, has something uh, about it which uh, is riveting. And that uh, you know, if you're honest and you make things, you make gestures, uh, it has staying power. But if somebody just uh, makes some gesture just for kind of a shock value, it's short-lived. Let's talk about the art scene in Qatar. I'd like to hear your observations, what you would like to see happening? Uh, well, you know, I've been uh, coming to uh, Doha since uh, 2000, and uh, that was my first trip, so I've seen a lot of change. And it's, uh, it's fantastic, and the experience is, 
it's moving, it, uh, it's a, a static. I mean, uh, uh, as soon as you land and you come into the airport, you're experiencing uh, such a, a refinement. The architecture, uh, you have some of the most amazing architectural uh, buildings in the world uh, uh, that are built and being built. And uh, it's wonderful, the discourse of bringing people together. I mean, I have found uh, Qatar, Doha, uh, to be about uh, inclusion. And, uh, you know, I'm here. I'm always thrilled to be invited and, uh, and, and, and to come here. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to feel part of something. Your honesty was riveting in your Made in Heaven series, which was uh, seen as a pornographic series with your former wife. What was behind the decision to do that? What sort of impact did that have on your career and your personal life? Uh, my personal life had had a big impact because uh, I went through a, a, a custody situation then for my son, so that was quite a, a distraction there. Because you lost your son to her, didn't you? Uh, took him away from you. Uh, uh, that's yeah. correct. Uh, he was abducted and taken uh, mm -hmm. to Europe. But uh, now my son's of age and uh, we have a, um, a rapport with each other and we're able to see each other now. But what motivated me uh, for that series was to have a dialogue in kind of the romantic tradition, the French romantic tradition of uh, Fragonard and uh, Boucher, and even going back to uh, somebody like Masaccio. Uh, I went and I saw the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and the guilt and shame on their faces. And I wanted to make a body of work that uh, uh, tried to remove that guilt and shame. You've said before that you appeal to the middle classes. Is that what you aim to do? And do you need to be middle class to appreciate your art or educated? Um, you know, I don't know if I said that. Uh, and maybe somebody said that about my work. But, you know, I remember when I was a child, I wanted to play football, kind of American football. And I uh, went to try out for the team, and automatically they wanted me to go out and play on the field. And I never really played football before, but I wanted to try to be on the team. And everybody was already so advanced. I was cut before even having a chance to even learn how to play the game and get on that field. And I never wanted anybody to come to art and have that same type of experience. I wanted uh, everybody to automatically be involved. I want myself to automatically be involved. So I'm the first that I don't want to be intimidated by art, uh, let alone the viewer. You, you said you strove, so, so, you, you desired to be part of the avant-garde grouping of Duchamp, the father of conceptual art, and Warhol, who's seen as the, the predecessor of you. Where do you see yourself as sitting in that artistic family tree? Uh, and Salvador Dali, of course, who you met. Well, you know, these are all my heroes, yeah. uh, all the names that, uh, that we've been speaking about. Uh, but I would hope that in some way part of that family at least to the best of my ability, to try to show how effortlessly uh, art incorporates all the human disciplines. I mean, being involved with art, you can uh, be having a dialogue with philosophy, sociology, psychology, physics, uh, aesthetics, all the human disciplines. And it so effortlessly brings this together. So anybody getting involved can in the areas of their own interests start to find kind of enlightenment and feel engaged and uh, feel a sense of a vaster future for themselves. You have your admirers, clearly. People who are happy to pay 58 million for your work. You also have those who criticize you and I guess that comes with success. And can I just put one or two to you and I just would like to hear your comment, uh, especially since we were talking about Duchamp and, and Warhol. Um, this could say is that your art historical glory resides in the fact that you're flat, there's no depth, it's all surface, even flatter than Warhol, this meaninglessness and banality, if nothing else, is your most important contribution to art. How do you feel when somebody says that? I mean, is... Um, <laughs> well, you know, I like to believe, if I hear something like that, I would like to reach that person a, a little more. I think that they could become more engaged, more open about art. I actually feel that uh, my work is not uh, just about the surface. I use a reflective surface automatically to have a discourse with philosophy. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is a reflective process. And to affirm the viewer, 
that uh, when you walk past one of my works, if it's a stainless steel piece, uh, you're reflected in it, and it affirms your own existence and that the art happens inside you. But I think there's some uh, profoundness uh, that comes from being able to connect with this dialogue, this vocabulary of human history. One more, if I may. Um, Coons is not exploiting the media for avant-garde purposes. He's in cahoots with the media. He has no me message, it's self-advertisement, and I find that repulsive. There are a lot of accusations about you being a fantastic salesman and then it's all about commercialism. I mean, is there anything wrong with that? Uh, you know, I enjoy sales. And when I say I enjoy sales, I don't feel that I'm a salesman as far as art. I'm, I make my artwork. But uh, when I was younger, I would go door to door and I would sell gift wrapping paper. I would sell chocolates as a kid. And it uh, brought me up to be self-reliant. And it's interacting with people. Uh, you know, when you knock on the door of someone's home, you don't know who's going to open the door. You don't know what they look like. You don't know what odors of the home may come out. So there's this aspect of acceptance and, and communication. Uh, so I've always been interested in sales, but art, I was able to be free from that, involved in communication and in dialogue with people. But uh, it, it's making uh, ideas, and ideas are something which communicate and can be very powerful and moving. How integral to your success was working in the markets? I never wanted to be naive. Yeah. So it, it gave me the ability to be self-reliant and to make the work I wanted to make and not be dependent on any collectors or any group. I could make uh, the works when I was a young artist, ex exactly uh, the works I wanted to. Uh, but, I think everybody's able to follow a little bit the, the concept of production, what can be self-destructive, what can be beneficial, and it can change. Uh, there was a time when a small production, making very few works, was maybe beneficial to an artist in supply and demand. Uh, today it's, it's kind of turned upside down, and you almost have to overproduce to be able to uh, be an artist that has enough work to really participate within the community. So, uh, I was going to ask you about the uh, contemporary art, the view of it at the moment, the fact that prices just seem to keep on going up. Why is that? You know, I can only give you a perspective uh, uh, from an artist's point of view, that uh, there's more and more people uh, around the world uh, that are educated and come into contact with uh, aesthetics and come in contact with just the richness of the human disciplines and how wonderful and uh, our lives can be and that we're in, uh, we're in control of that. I mean, we're able to enrich our own lives by exciting our minds and uh, we can make our lives better. The sordid side to that, and I know that there's a dialogue happening at the moment, this huge amount of cash going through these paintings. Is there a money laundering concern at the moment? You know, I, I, I wouldn't know about that. I mean, I think the, you'd have to speak to gallerists or people involved in that area. You know, artists are really, we're kind of removed from uh, that area. And it's kind of a tradition back, uh, I guess, for at least since the 1900s. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not really involved in that area. You were area. talking about how artists now really have to possibly churn out a lot more work. I know that you've got a a factory, sometimes 120 people working there. How do you get them to deliver on your vision? Yeah. Uh, can I go back to the money laundering? Yes. Uh, the only thing I can say there, uh, you know, you, you usually know who the client is. Mm. And uh, you're usually pretty aware that, you know, they're a collector. And um, so I don't know. I've never really thought that that was a, a large problem. Uh, I wouldn't know, that's but uh, but usually you know that it's a collector yeah. that, that's there. Um, and, and what a wonderful thing to be involved in, right? I was going to—I was asking you about your factory and uh, the amount of people that you have there, and how you are able to get them to deliver your vision. Mm -hmm. uh, by kind of spending time and taking the responsibility to educate everyone exactly what my vision is, and to set up systems that uh, help people achieve that vision. 
And so, you know, if somebody's working for me, and the average person's been with me about nine years. Uh. Some people have been with me over two decades. And it's a compliment. Uh, uh, but there, there are some people that, uh, uh, you know, just started uh, two weeks ago. But it's really my responsibility to manage and to set up systems so that they can make the gestures exactly the way I want them. Because, you know, I do not want to make a painting or make a sculpture that anything is on the surface of that work or anywhere within that object, uh, something that I wouldn't do exactly uh, the way it is as a finished work. Uh, I'm responsible for each and every mark, each and every aspect of its surface and its being. Extraordinary. So you've got to be really particular, don't you? Uh, I'm, I'm not a perfectionist, but I really have only one chance to exercise that vision, and uh, so I really want to get it right. Do you uh, think there's such a thing as perfection? Uh, um, I think th that there is, and I think it's, uh, it's a, a fetish. It's like a dog chasing its tail. Uh, there's a loss of energy there, but I do think that there's also something that's responsibility, and it's kind of like a moral respect to the viewer, and you want to show them as much uh, respect for them as possible. You want them to be able to maintain the abstraction that they're experiencing as long as possible. So uh, I always try to take care of every little detail so no one ever feels let down. That, you know, if you're examining something, you don't all of a sudden look at an area and, oh, why is that not finished? And have that abstraction broken. Um, so you've been iconic for so long now. What's the future? You know, I don't think that uh, the future, I don't think anything's really changing uh, that much. I think that art's always performing. Uh, in the same way. Uh, now there are different times where uh, art can be used in different manners. There's a, a history of it being used politically or it's been used uh, uh, in religious terms. But uh, when an artist is uh, making something, uh, it's a process of following their interests because that's all you have. You, d you don't really have anything other than your uh, interests. And if you focus on them, this is an activity which uh, connects. And that's where I find art. That's where I find uh, the things that uh, move me and that if people enjoy my work, uh, move by the viewer. So what's your aim to do next? What would you like to uh, To exercise achieve? that freedom. You know, uh, Picasso is a, a tremendous example of how, you know, a good artist gets better. And, uh, you know, your great artists get better. You know, uh, Van Gogh got better, Cezanne got better, Matisse got better, uh, Picasso got better, Leonardo da Vinci got better. Uh, I want to get better. And, and what uh, is better for you? To exercise that freedom, to make the things I really want to make, you know, to take advantage of the moment that I have as a human being to do what I would like to do. And uh, it's the hardest thing for people to do in life. Uh, we, they have all different anxieties. A lot of different things block you from really doing what you would like to do. And uh, so I really want to exercise that freedom. I, I can make anything. Well, you know, I want to make the things that I really have the opportunity to, uh, to realize that I can pull forth out of myself. What a lovely position to be in. Do you surround we, yourself by you? We all have that. Yeah. We have that every day in our lives. And really artists, artists, can, well, artists are in a position to be examples to people uh, how you can do that. Mm -hmm. And you can do it in all different ways in your own life. Jeff Coons, thank you very much. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.